I'm going to start where John ended. And in fact, I think I often follow John. In fact, I was trying to figure out, trying to remember where I met John, and I think it might have been in Key West when he and his MacArthur mental health colleagues um, had their academic, incredibly important academic meetings on the beach. And I was trotting through in my suit and heels thinking that this was, you know, standard academic meeting. But um, we have worked together on a number of things and I, I uh, want, what I want to do is to really tell you some things about what the public thinks and perhaps, or maybe it's perhaps what they're willing to say. Um, I'm a sociologist and, you know, I understand things like mode matters. We know from research that people are more willing to write down prejudice and discriminatory remarks than they are to uh, tell you face to face, which is what our study was, or our studies have been. Um, that, but they're also more likely to say nasty things than to actually do nasty things. And I think that, uh, well, I'm hoping that what I'm going to talk to you about um, is useful for you. Many of you uh, are in the trenches on both research and in the provision of care. And so I, you know, I wanted to start off where John started off, which was this idea that you know there the the press, the questionable press, um, you know, often promotes these ideas of violence and mental illness. But you know, we don't have to go that far. We can actually go to um, sources that uh, I have a lot of respect for. And I remember going into class the day after the second presidential debate um, recently, and I was there was just you know, steam coming out of my ears, and I said to my cl my students, I said, do, do you know why I'm upset about the presidential debate last night? And only, of course, only about a quarter of them had actually listened to the presidential debate, given that, you know, college, they have other things to do. Um, and they gave me all kinds of political reasons. You know, Romney said this, or Obama said that, and I was like, no. Three times during that second presidential debate, President Obama said, uh, we have to get guns out of the hands of the mentally ill. And I just about lost it, okay? Um, but it turns out that um, what he's been talking about isn't um, isolated to even very well-informed people. I had a graduate student who did a study, part of her dissertation, where she looked at the press in the United States, and these, this was not the questionable press, but this was the New York Times and in Germany, Der Spiegel, and I don't remember what the Icelandic paper was, and even if I knew, I know I couldn't pronounce it. So, um, but what she found was that um, she did a search of all articles on mental illness over a certain time period, and she found that in the United States, 46% of the articles raised the issue of fear, danger, and coercion. Okay, in Germany, the theme was quite different. Um, in fact, they didn't really have a particular theme, but if there was one, about 26% of the articles talked about fear of repeating their past with regard to vulnerable groups. And in Iceland, as my student says, the most perfect society on earth, uh, they had a theme, and the theme was, you know, we need to integrate these people. They are fellow Icelanders, okay? So um, I'm hoping that at the end that uh, I will have a positive message for you because it's not sociology that it's the dismal science. I think it's economics these days. Okay. Um, I also wanted to be uh, positive and hopeful by uh, reporting to you that I was privileged to go to the uh, mental health conference uh, or the conference on mental health at the White House on June 2nd this year. And the remarks were started uh, by President Obama in which there was almost an orthogonal turn in what he talked about. He talked about how people with mental illness are not more violent than the average American citizen. He talked about the need for hope and he talked about the need for recovery. He talked about the need to eliminate prejudice and discrimination. So we have the sense that people can change when they're well informed. Um, and I, what I'd like to talk about a little bit is how and when this might happen. Um, we do have done a series of studies called the National Stigma Studies. And I have to tell you, this is not my original interest. This is not um, what I focused on my research for the first 15 years of my career. My interest is really in how people construct, you know, typical sociological jargon, how people socially construct the onset of mental health problems and how they travel pathways to care or not to care. 
Uh, and I, I do that particularly from a social network perspective because I was very interested um, and frustrated with the sort of very individualistic models that suggested that it was what a person said and did. And while I recognized the importance of free will, I really didn't know anybody who didn't end up in treatment um, as a result of being having a little push from somebody. So I wanted to rethink it in terms of that. Uh, but after I was able to uh, provide some data that suggested that social network processes are in fact in operation in pathways to care, uh, I wanted to take on the issue of how networks and culture come together to push people with the same networks to care away from care. And I was re started reading outside my discipline. And um, I started reading statements that said that individuals um, in the United States didn't have to worry anymore because stigma had dissipated. I had just spent nine months in the psychiatric units of two leading hospitals in a major Midwestern city, and I wonder what that city could be, and I didn't see any evidence that stigma had dissipated. And so I started to look to try to find the literature on stigma in the United States, and I found that there had not been a national stigma study in the United States since 1955. Um, now, there were some other studies that were not stigma studies, but had important information, and I think they're more in your wheelhouse. So the Americans view their mental health studies coming out of University of Michigan uh, that were a result of a congressional mandate. And so we were able to uh, do a study in 1996 was the first one, and we've done one almost every two years since then, either on adults or children on the issues of psychiatric medications, et cetera. And I want to start with the bad news, um, because I want to end with the good news, OK? Uh, it turns out, and maybe none of you are surprised, but stigma is alive and well in the United States. About 50% of Americans um, express uh, prejudicial attitudes towards people with mental health problems. And we were able to answer one of the, the, the um, debates that had happened, at least in sociology, um, when we were arguing that mental illness was a myth, and I don't want to go there, um, which was, is it the label or is it the behavior? Well, it turns out, and one of the reasons I support looking across silos, um, which is a big academic topic these days, is because it turns out it's both. People respond to different, we, what we gave them was stories of people. We didn't tell them it was a mental illness because we didn't want to either, uh, we wanted to see whether or not they recognized these problems as mental health problems, um, and, but we also wanted to have very great specificity in line with um, the DSM. And so what we found was that both of these things mattered, and it turns out that about 60% of Americans think that people with mental health uh, problems are dangerous, and that 40% would support coercion into hospitals, and that actually jumps to 90% to if you add to the end of that, should they be hospitalized if they're seen as dangerous to self or others. So the American public is listening, and the American public is not stupid. They have heard what's happened in the last 20 years in the United States. But perhaps one of the uh, most frustrating pieces of data that we have is that we were able to do a 10-year follow-up because the period from 1996 to 2006 was actually one in which there was more thrown at stigma um, and mental illness in some ways, not treatment, but other ways. Um, and what we found out is that while Americans were very well educated with regard to these ideas about uh, the causes of mental illness, the needle on stigma has not budged. Um, and so that's really a problem. So let me get to the good news. Uh, the good news, um, and this is, I think, uh, really important to us, is that, and some of them were surprises, I have to say, um, that one of the things that we saw between the Americans View Their Mental Health Studies and um, the National Stigma Studies that we did uh, with my co-author, co Ken Heller, who's in the audience, um, was that, in fact, Americans are much more open to talking to family and friends. In the past, they said they would talk to their, the clergy, they would talk to psychiatrists, they would talk to um, you know, other people, they talked to their physicians, but they didn't really want to talk to their family and friends about it. We see a tremendous increase in willingness to be more open about mental health problems. Uh, with my, my colleagues at Columbia University, Bruce Link and Joe Phelan, we found that Americans have really become much more educated about the underlying causes of mental illness. They get it. 
they get the brain disorder. So the work that you're doing here, they understand it. Now, wait, do they understand it, understand it? Uh, I don't know about that. Do they really believe that mental illnesses are caused by brain disorders and chemical imbalance? At least they know enough to say that and not say that it's caused by bad parenting or the will of God or weak character. Um, and you know, in some ways that's enough for me because part of the way of stopping prejudice and discrimination is stopping people from being willing to say those things out loud. Uh, the American public is also smart in that they understand and reflected some of the things that John talked about, which is actually, and this was one of the big surprises to us, it turns out that Americans are much more stigmatizing of people with substance abuse disorders and even more stigmatizing of people with drug dependence than they are with people with schizophrenia. And we were really surprised by that. Okay, um, so what, what should we be doing in terms of this? Um, I think we need to switch our MO, right? We've had a, a line since the 1940s that what we need to do to, to help people with mental illness is have the American public understand that mental illness is a disease like any other. Okay, enough, they get it. They get it, they've gotten that message, they can repeat that message. Again, whether they believe it in their heart, heart of hearts would be great, but as long as they know enough not to go other places, I think that's a really good step in the direction. So this is what I call the good news, bad news section, because I think what we need to do at this point is we need to, be, to start with myths. Because as we talk to people, the way that American, and this is in particular an American ideology, the way that they understand anything negative that happens in American society is by saying that person must be sick. In order to do something that horrendous, they must be sick. And they quickly make the translation uh, from sick to mental illness. I think we need to change our target. So the target has always been education or knowledge. Again, our studies have shown very clearly that uh, they get it. We really need to move our attempts to reduce stigma to issues of inclusion and integration. Um, and I think we just have to look very, um, we can look very quickly at, at what we, we're now calling structural stigma or institutional stigma to even see how the ADA is implemented for people in wheelchairs but not people with depression and to think about those kinds of issues. Um, I agree with uh, John in terms of not going toward uh, Tory's explanation or uh, ideas of inciting the American public to the danger of people with mental illness. Um, we published a piece in the American Journal of Psychiatry to which uh, we were I, both pleased and frightened that E. Tour, e. Tour fully, uh, e. Fuller Tory responded, but he said it seems to be that these sociologists, naive in quotes, um, were surprised by the findings. And we said we're neither surprised nor, nor not surprised or unsurprised. That's not our job. Our job is to not assume what culture looks like, but to tell you that the assumptions that you're making about culture are either um, have evidence to back it up or not. Um, but we were able to respond to that in part by showing that in our studies there's no evidence of the association of stigma with public willingness to fund the mental health system in the United States. So from our point of view, even though the data were limited, there's absolutely no justification for taking that approach. Um, in addition to thinking about, um, about these issues, I think we also have to think about uh, myth busting with regard to what is called courtesy stigma. I don't think there's anybody who works in the mental health system that doesn't understand the notion of courtesy stigma regarding the idea of saying that uh, you're a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a sociologist that works on issues of mental health. Uh, in fact, I was at the National Institute of Heart, Lung, and Blood um, one year. They had brought me in. They were trying to do a uh, 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 sort of agenda setting thing on, not on stigma, they were trying to do it on understanding health behaviors. And so I, I don't really even remember what I was saying, but um, I said, I was saying something about, um, well, I don't know how this works with regard to cardiac disease, but in mental health, and you know, I went on to say whatever I was gonna say, I was sitting next to a cardiologist who leaned over to me and said, yes, but that's psychiatry, that's hardly medicine. And I was like, okay, uh, courtesy stigma, alive and well, check. Okay, 
Uh, I think we also have to understand that when we have successes in the mental health system, that doesn't mean that we have to defund those programs. Uh, one of the experts in our audience, David Perkins, about assertive community treatment systems. We know that they work, but uh, under the recovery model, the first thing that has happened is that when people recovered, the idea was, well, we no longer need recovery teams, and they were defunded um, in some of the projects that um, were being done under Michelle Salyers up at IUPUI. Um, in terms of other myths, I think that we have to understand that sometimes a little coercion is good, which I think fits in with John's ideas as well. Uh, in our studies, we found when we just simply asked people, tell us how you got here. How did you get to this hospital? Well, about 46% of people told us the story of choice, you know, how at some point they made a decision. About 25% told us a story of either what we call hard or soft coercion or legal or non-legal coercion. And what was most interesting to us is about 30% of people told us a story that we had to label muddling through because they had no story of exactly how they got there. They did tell us a story, sometimes 20 pages of transcript story, but there was no active ingredient in terms of either them making a decision or being picked up by the police or being forced by their mother to go. And finally, I wanted to end on um, something that, that has to do with stigma, which is a project that John and I are working on right now. Um, for us, the next logical step was actually to look at stigma global-wide in terms of thinking about um, the issue that many of you have read in your psychiatry, psychology, social work uh, textbooks about the international studies of schizophrenia. If you remember what those studies concluded, they concluded that people with schizophrenia get better in India and China, but not in Denmark, the United States, or Great Britain. Well, I think there are some issues with those studies, but that wasn't really my role, and there aren't really any good data, long-term longitudinal follow-up studies of people with schizophrenia. But we were able to sort of take on the corollary of the ISOS studies, and, and in fact, I, I believe those findings for some very specific reasons. But the corollary that you probably read in your training was that the reason that people do better in India than in Switzerland is because in traditional so societies, there's less stigma. People are uh, kinder and gentler in India than they are in the United States. I'm here to tell you that our findings suggest that is absolutely not the case. And the willingness to go to coerce and to think about people with mental illness as dangerousness, as dangerous, is much higher in the developing world than it is in the developed world. So I think in this next phase of following on the kinds of research that John has been doing and the kinds of work that we've been doing over in the sociology department, is we really have to step back and rethink some of the long-held truths that we've had about these issues and, and design a new way of thinking thinking about how to deal with mental illness in the community and how to think about the elimination of prejudice and discrimination. Thank you.